This is Season 2, Episode 8 of My Modular Journey. And don't panic. You did not click on the wrong video. The rack is in fact empty for a reason today. Because it is today that I finally get to build my Behringer System 100M using the Behringer Go Rack. I've tried to record this episode a number of times, trying various ways of presenting the System 100, and, and I'm, I found that doing individual modules one at a time wasn't going to cut it, because that's, that's ten, there are 10 modules that make up all the modules that Behringer has created, and that's 10 episodes. That would be way too much. I don't think my YouTube channel would survive all the dislikes, because people out there seem to hate Behringer for whatever reason. So instead, I'm just going to combine them all into one video, so you guys can just hate one video. How's that? Make it easy on you. So getting right into the modules, let's start with the Behringer 112. It's a VCO. It's a dual VCO. It's got two. Uh, each side has a pulse, pulse width mod CV point here, which can be attenuated with this pot right here. It also has two VCO outs. So you have two audio out signals here. You can also modulate you can also do pulse width manually if you want to pick a specific pulse width and stick to it. You can manually tune it in here, and that's for both sides. Oh, there's also the wave selector, which is a triangle, saw, and, of course, down at the bottom, pulse width. Uh, here's your range setter. You've got between 2 feet and 32 feet, so that's a, that's a pretty good range. Here's the pitch knob for fine-tuning the pitches. Uh, over here is the sync out and in, so again, you can come out of one, uh, one of them and into another with a strong or weak signal. And then last but not least, down here at the bottom are these mod in jacks. This is CV points that come in and how they are affected. Uh, all of these seem to be pitch related, so if you put, a, if you put a, a signal in here and crank this all the way up, then this could be your CV in for what, what the uh, pitch is that you want it to play. And then you could put another one over here, which like an LFO, and, and modulate it a little bit to give it like a little vibrato. So that's pretty neat. Uh, the, the module itself, and this will be the, this will be true for all of them, so I'll just cover it right now. This is a, an aluminum plate. It's not plastic. It's pretty good construction. The, the jacks, I have played with these a lot, and the jacks are nice and tight. There's nothing loosey-goosey about them. It doesn't feel really cheap. The pots are pretty sticky. So you can't accidentally bump them and knock something out of tune. Uh, these are a little wobbly, but I mean, not wobbly, but they're, they're easy to, to bump. So if you are turning one of these, you could, <laughs> you could easily throw your, your oscillator out of pitch. So right in here, it's a little tight. But other, other than that, everything feels pretty sturdy. Uh, all the knobs and switches are pretty tight. So that'll be, the, that'll be true for all of these that I'm going to show. So that's the Behringer 112 Dual VCO. Next up is the Behringer 121 Dual VCF. So again, we have three signals in. So it's three different things you can bring into one filter bank. Uh, and then, it, of course, attenuate here. So it could be, again, CV or, sound, or audio in or something else that you want to mess with. Uh, it has a, um, two outputs, VCF outs. So three in, two outs, and then modulation points, again, with attenuators. Here is a high pass filter, like kind of like a level setter, off one, off one, two, or three. And then of course cut off and resonance here on these sliders. And again, the sliders all feel pretty, pretty solid. They're very similar to what I see in the um, uh, ARP 2600. Next up is the Behringer 130 VCA, again, dual VCA, three signals in, all attenuated. Uh, initial gain, is like you see on most VCAs, uh, a high and a low out. So this is high, like a uh, mic, and low instrument. Uh, exponential and linear curves on, the, on what you're CVing here. So you can... Uh, <clears throat> you can put a, like an envelope in here and put the, raise this up here, uh, attenuate it up to get your, that's how you uh, open and close the gate for your VCA. Next one is the Behringer 140, which is a dual envelope. 
And this dual envelope has a gate in, so this triggers the envelope to engage. Uh, it's typical ADSR. It has two normal envelope outs per, per envelope, and then it has an inverted. So there's three envelope outs per envelope generator. That's pretty cool. And then down here is an LFO block. So this is an LFO with a frequency in, a trigger in. You could set the frequency ranges in low, medium, high as far as how fast this frequency goes. And you could pick different, uh, different shapes of your waveforms for your LFO. And here is a normal and an inverted LFO out. And down here is a normal LFO output or, or a one-tenth LFO output. If you have it on times one, the LFO coming out is the full sweep, but if it's on one-tenth, it's smaller. And to round off the original System 101 part of the System 100 is, of course, the Behringer 150 ring mod. Well, there's a lot of pieces in here. Ring mod, noise generator, sample and hold, and another LFO, which is exactly the same as the LFO over here. So I will put this in and show you, take a look at this right here. This is, uh, I'm going to drop a picture in down here to show what the 101 module of the full system 100M from Roland used to look like. It consisted of dual VCO, dual VCF, dual VCA, dual envelope and LFO, and then a ring mod, sample and hold, noise generator, LFO module. This was the original uh, the original setup. Uh, additional to the standard 101 rack here, I have uh, I purchased also the Behringer 182 analog sequencer. So there are 16 steps here, uh, tunable by these pots. This, this selects this, the pitch values here. It has a tempo knob, a delay, uh, which is like a uh, almost like a portamento, a, a, a slew between each note that it's that it's hitting so you could just slew between each one there and then of course there's a gate output how much what's the time between each uh, the gate time between each step here are the step selectors from one all the way up here to eight uh, and then whether or not it's a repeating loop or it steps one at a time or it goes one loop and then stops start and stop button uh, this is the interesting part here also is there's a parallel or series switch so in parallel, both of these run the same thing uh, in repeat mode or step mode. They'll, they'll run top to bottom and play out of each one of these jacks will play individual notes from the left or the right side of this. However, if you put it in series, it will take this, each, each one of these 16 steps will be put out of both of these. So that's, that's kind of interesting as well. Another thing that's interesting about this sequencer is if you were to put it on four steps, for instance, it will still play all, all eight of these and then four of these before looping back. So you put it on five, for instance, it'll do eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and then start over again. So that's how you can get some really interesting uh, polyrhythms or uh, my, my, my favorite prog rock type, type meters going on. So anyway. Uh, I haven't played with that too much either, but uh, I've seen demos on it that are pretty cool. So, again, CV1 and 2 is for each one of these channels out. You have a gate out here, which would go to your gate in of your envelope generator here. Uh, there's also a tempo in, so you could use an external clock to clock this. And then trigger in and out for, uh, like a trigger in, if you're in step mode, the trigger in will bump it forward one. So you'll get to see what that looks like later as well. That'll be part of my audio demo. The next module that I picked up was is the Behringer 173. This is a quad gate and multiples module. And this is six channels of three mults. So you put in a source here and you can split it three ways. And the same with, all, with these gates in here. A module I wasn't really too sure I needed, but because I was kind of trying to build an entire System 100, uh, I went ahead and picked up also the Behringer 172 here. And what this is, this is a combination of a phase shifter, an audio delay, and a, sh a very simple LFO and a gate delay. Um, the interesting part for me on this one is the gate delay. I always liked uh, that gate delay. So you can take uh, a gate out to a gate in and then set the delay a little bit and it'll actually cause it to delay. So if you have two of them running, it gives a kind of a little, a little uh, delay effect. It's kind of neat. 
So something interesting that Behringer did with a couple of their modules is they kind of comboed them up a bit. And that one example is this Behringer 297 module here. This is actually a combination of the, of the System 100 132 and the System 100 165, which is a dual portamento and a CV utility, CV mixer utility. So you can see here, uh, again, C CV signals come in and you can manipulate them with uh, ver in various ways. Again, I haven't spent a lot of time with this module, but I do want to uh, uh, make a complete system, so I wanted to add this as well. The, the next module that Behringer did a combo of is the Behringer 305. And this is a combination of a parametric EQ and a mixer headphone amp. The parametric EQ was uh, System 100 174, and the mixer oscillator headphone amp was the System 100 131. Add those two together, and it's 305. So this is pretty much all of the individual modules of the System 100M, but uh, very similar to government spending, why have one when you can have two at twice the price? All right, now we're getting close to being in business. Now you're looking at what is the full System 100M and all the components of Behringer's that I've purchased. So this is probably a good time to walk through the standard episode description, why I chose it and how I plan to use it, since now you see everything here in place. Mrs. Behringer's recreation of the classic Roland System 100 from the 80s, uh, the entirety of this purchase, the full instrument, all of these pieces cost less than my first four modules purchased in June of 2021 because these were all out of stock and I wanted to get into modular, so I chose to buy something that was more readily available. Other modules are pretty darn expensive. And that leads me to an interesting point, is I know there's, a, again, there's a lot of Behringer haters out there, but I do not hate Behringer because I'm still able to get some relatively good quality equipment, you know, not too expensive. I've, uh, I've talked about how well made these are, how well all the jacks are, all the pots feel really good and sturdy. They, they make great tones. These are not super deep and super extensive modules. They're meant to emulate something super old, which is not overly fancy uh, 40 years ago. So they do the job they're meant to do, and they sound really good, which you'll find out here in a moment. They sound pretty darn good for, for uh, as simple as they are. Uh, and so it does the job. That's what it really comes down to. Does it do the job? And my answer is yes, it does the job. As for why I went with the dual setup here, like you see, this is all Tim Shoebridge's fault. Thank you, Tim, for your wonderful videos on System 100 because uh, I heard his audio demos and they sound fantastic. I mean, they're gonna sound way better than anything I'm gonna do. But hearing four VCOs uh, going on, on his demos were, was just, mesmerizing. I loved the sound of that. So this is a four voice system, four VCOs, four VCS, four VCAs, four envelopes, the mixer at one end, the, the sound toys in the middle here, and then four channels of sequencing. Whew, that's a lot. So why I chose this as, a, as an instrument, so there's a little bit of a backstory to this, and the, and the quick version of that is my first attempt to build a modular system or was the System 100M, but due to various stock problems and chip shortages and things like that in the world today, uh, I, I could not get a hold of hardly any of these modules. There was, there was only a few of them available at the time and there was no VCO, so there was really no point to begin. So I went a different route. I did the Mutable Instruments route instead because that was my second favorite. So even though I wandered down a different path in 2021, uh, this was a thing I always wanted to return to. I've, I've definitely wanted to build my own System 100 because I'm super old and I remember the System 100 from 40 years ago and I remember drooling over it then and how unaffordable it was then. And here it is now in my house for 1400 bucks. 1700 bucks if you count the case. 
So how I plan to use it is simply as a single instrument. This is going to be uh, like any other one of my keyboards. It has all the voices, all the configuration. I'm going to patch the hell out of it, and I'm going to use it as a, as a beefy, monstrous voice uh, in my choir. And that's it. It's, it's that simple. As for the non-Behringer modules for this instrument, this is the reason why the A160-2 was purchased. You've already seen the episode on this. It is my clock divider. It is going to go up here on the top left, and it's going to handle splitting the clocks for the different sequencers or other things that I want to, to trigger uh, in the rack. Similarly, the 4Quant by Laddick, the Quad Quantizer, is going to go down here. And this is to help me rein in the wandering voltages of these analog sequencers. And I'll show you what that sounds like a little later. These are really hard to tune. They're very sensitive. There's a wide range of, uh, I think there's five volts in here. And so tapping this just a little bit really sends it off. So sometimes when, when it loops around, they get a little warmer and they tend to detune a little bit and it's hard to keep them in tune. So I discovered that I wanted a quad quantizer and this is the one that, that uh, stepped up to do the job. So these are non-Behringer, so they're additional pieces that are just part of this to make this system better. Uh, for this episode, I'm going to put in the, uh, the Mordax data. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the data in here just so we can fiddle with some of this stuff and watch what's going on, make it a little easier. And then the last thing for this rack, I intended to use the Endorphins Milky Way which you haven't seen yet. I wanted to use this as an effects box. It's not doing a really great job, and I'm not sure if it's just me or I haven't figured out how to use it yet. Uh, so that's why the Strymon Big Sky, which is off the camera right here, the Strymon Big Sky was picked up as the outboard re reverb for this system. So no matter what Endorphins is doing, everything's gonna then leave and go into the Big Sky before it heads to the DAW for that final, that final little fluff. So this is it. This is now the full instrument. The case is almost full. I think I have one or two HP left here at the end for anything else if I if I wanted. Uh, but that's it. This is what I wanted. Is that really it? Yep, that's really it. So I'm going to pause the video now and I'm going to stick all this in. I'm going to get the get all the ribbon cables and power hooked up and then we'll start with uh, with a quick quick demo of how to hook up some of the voices and, and see what sequencing looks like. All right, everybody is mounted in the rack. I've got all the uh, components in place. I've got data here temporarily to help uh, look at various uh, signal paths as we try different things that I can't really hear a difference of, but we'll, we'll see if we can see the difference. Uh, also some clock divider action going on over here. I'm gonna take this out of the clock out here uh, later uh, for some other stuff. And I have my green, blue, red, yellow coming out of data. Yes, everything is beautifully color-coded <laughs> off here to the mixer for this first part, because what I'm going to do first is we're going to tune the oscillators. So let's get some power on here. Turn down Big Sky so we don't have to hear anything. Head on over to the tuner. So first things first, we're going to tune the oscillator. So let's take the VCO out. Let's just plug all these guys in to start with. VCO1, VCO2, VCO3, VCO4. All right, so that's all four of them plugged in. Right now I have the um, pitch turned way down and we're on the green one, so we'll do that one first. I'm not completely sure if this is supposed to be a, a C like the eight foot is supposed to be a C2 or C sharp, or C sharp, C2 or not, but we're, uh, we're just gonna tune this up to be C2 at the eight foot mark. And it kind of sounds like this. So there is the, uh, the triangle wave, the saw, and the pulse width, and the pulse width Again, can be manually configured here. So I just want to tune, uh, tune my, my blue one next. And I, 
these are pretty sensitive, so I'm just going to kind of get them in the ballpark. Hmm, starting to get good at this. Look at that. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> Dummy. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> That was embarrassing. Maybe I should cut that out. All right, uh, so all four of my oscillators are at eight feet. The eight feet mark and they're in tune. So if I turn them all up, they should all be in tune. Let me pan. So they're pretty darn close, aren't they? So if I now go to the saw, add a little bit of fatness, so you can kind of hear them warbling around a little bit because one of them is not perfectly in tune. I mean, I just I just can't get it there. This knob is too sensitive. darn close all right so with that in mind uh, I think one of the first things I wanted to do after tuning what do I want to do oh I guess uh, okay so now that we got now that we're at C2 now let's take some sequencing magic into the the CV jack here and see if we can uh, make some noise. So if I take CV out, so I'm just gonna use the color, I'm gonna color code these for now, just to avoid any confusion later. I'm turning up the attenuators on all the inputs for the, for the pitch CVs, so that way they all come in. Oh, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? See, as soon as I turned up the... Uh, something's leaking through because it changes the pitch. So I've never noticed that before. That's interesting. Oh, goodness. That was quite a, quite a bit off, wasn't it? So now I'm going to plug in the sequencer step one. Sequencer two. Sequencer three. Sequencer four. So this is what I'm talking about, tuning these sequencers. Where they're, they're a little difficult. So if I want to get to a C4, I have to drop this. And then tune it again. To get it close to C4 there, then I want to get my next one. By the way, I'm looking at data again here. That's kind of close. Man, these are really sensitive. And then to the fourth one is pretty close. Ooh, that's real close. Look at that. So now I have 
the first step of both of my sequencers set to C4. If I step forward on one of them, step forward on the next one, you can hear the sequencers. Let's, let's, let's run them. This is going to sound like absolute chaos. That's insane. <laughs> that is absolute insanity. All right, so the point of showing that is I wanted to show how difficult it is. Let me get back to the first oscillator here. Let me get back to the first oscillator here. That's this side on this one on this side. We'll get back to the green one so you can see the on the data, the tuning. So what I want to show now is if I take this instead of coming through, instead of going right into the oscillator, if I come into the quantizer and then come out of the quantizer into the oscillator and then come up here and try to turn this this tuning knob you can see how it's jumping a whole semitone right so now this is when I know that even though I tuned this here earlier to be in tune it's out of tune again so now I can raise this up a little bit and so now I have Sequencer playing a C4 because that's what I just chose. This this hap this one position just happens to be C4 for me. Uh, into the quantizer, out of the quantizer to the closest semitone, into the oscillator, out of the oscillator to data showing me C4. And now I know that's in tune. Well, it's in tune relatively speaking. It's, it is a C4, but who knows where these knobs actually need to be in order to make that C4. So that's a good topic or a good talking point there because this is the thing that took me a very long time in my brain to understand because all my synthesizers sitting across the room, they have all these magic little little wheels and dials you turn to get it in A440 or A432, whatever you fancy. And there's none of this guessing where the pot is and then offsetting everybody else to still be in tune anyway. Well, this is one of the glorious things about modular that I that brought me to it and that I love the most is uh, almost like there's no rules. This doesn't have to be 12 o'clock to be in tune. I just do that because my brain works that way. <laughs> I want it to be in tune. So let's get a 12 o'clock going and let's get as close to 12 o'clock as we can on the on the sequencer. So, uh, anyway, and I don't even know why. That's just, again, this is the way my brain works. So now if I want to, to do some more work with this, I can bump the, uh, I can put it into step mode and I can bump the sequencer forward one. And then I know I can go to D4. And then I can go to like E4. So you see, I'm just gonna do a scale real quick here. And this, this, the quantizer helps me find that note quicker. So it's that simple. Uh, whereas without the quantizer in place, I'd have to really finely tune each one of these pots and then any amount of bumping it or any amount of heat, like if it suddenly starts warming up or gets warm in the room or cool, these voltages can change just enough to, to suddenly hit the wrong note and then your sequence sounds terrible. So I highly recommend a quantizer. So moving along to another one of the, the toys, I'm gonna come out of the quantizer real quick. I'm gonna I'm gonna shove this in sample and hold. So 
So there's a clock rate on it, but there's no range that I can tell. I can't see a range. I mean, I guess you could put a signal in here to try to wrangle that. But right now this sample and hold is all over the place. Let's try that real quick. Let's take uh, let's take an LFO out to the SIG in. Divide it by 10. So see now I'm, I'm kind of wrangling that in a little bit. So it's following the LFO up and down, but it's following it only on a divided by 10 basis instead of the full range of the LFO. So this is the full range of the LFO. Whereas this is a small bit of the LFO. So now there's a clock there's a clock on the LFO that's changing how fast it's rising and falling, and then there's a clock on the sample and hold. Anyway, that, so that's that's interesting. The sample and hold's kind of interesting. I think we can also do uh, we can do a noise. Real quick, I'm just going to change how the out works here. I'm going to take the out over to the VCF real quick over here. And then let's take the out of the VCF back down there. Okay. So now what I've done is I've taken that same first VCO over to the first VCF. I've turned up the attenuation so the sound comes all the way through it. And now I want to take a longer cable. I just love being color coordinated. I want to take a noise signal out of the, the noise generator and I'm going to throw it here into the uh, a signal 2. What happens if I do that? So now we've added a little noise to this. And then if I take an LFO... So with an LFO coming out into, into one of the modulation points here and turning up the attenuation, you can hear it affecting the, the, the noise that's being generated because cutoff's all the way up. If we turn cutoff down, it's now what it's really doing is it's changing the cutoff frequency. All right, so I think what I want to do from this point is I'm going to patch up one of the voices all the way down. I'm going to get rid of all this test wire, all these test wires. Um, and let me hook this up the, the way I normally would. All right, so now I have a nice little stereo field here, left and right. I have uh, initial gain turned up right now because I'm not doing any enveloping or any gating of the VCA. Uh, I'm gonna go, let me go turn on uh, Big Sky here a little bit. Sounds pretty. All right, so for the next, for my next trick, I want to take a gate out from my sequencer. I want to come over here to the gate in of an envelope. I'm going to shape it just a little bit here, just real quick, throw it in there. Then, I want to take an envelope out one to one of my VCAs here. And I'm going to turn down the input gain of both of these for just a moment. Then I'm going to turn up the attenuation for both these. Because remember, everything I'm doing is in twos. So the gate time on the sequencer is really low.
and the release is kind of high. If I turn the gain, the gate length up here on the sequencer, it's, it's, it's holding the gate open longer, so that means it's like holding the note longer, so this attack, decay, sustain has a little bit more time to take effect. Whereas if it's turned all the way down, it's like you're tapping the key really fast and then release gets most of the, it, 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 it jumps from attack to release real quick, real quick. And now, when I stop the sequencer, it shuts everything off because now we're, we've gated the VCA. The VCA is closed. So I think that might be it for the, uh, for the basic how to make a sound. I've taken two voices all the way through to the end. Uh, I haven't done anything fancy with them yet. I'll do that in the next part because this one's already 30 minutes. In this part, we have explored uh, some things about the ring modulation unit, the um, sample and hold, the, the white noise generator, the LFO. Uh, we've tuned the oscillators. We've quantized the sequencers. We've uh, built two voices all the way through to the end, uh, out to Big Sky, and then off to the DAW. And then we added, the very last thing I just added, was a gate control over the envelope. And I'm only using one of them right now one of the envelopes to do to handle two of the voices and that's how wonderful it sounds all right so well let me take another break and i will come back and i think i want to explore um i think i want to explore this uh this quad gates and multiples and the phase shifter and see if I can get Mixer over here, or this uh, Portamento thing to do anything. I've, I've not been successful with that module yet, but we'll see if I get somewhere today. All right, be right back. In this part, I'm going to show uh, a little bit of the what the gate delay does and how, I'm gonna, how I plan to use it. And uh, in order to do that, I took the gate out from the sequencer one, and I put it into the mult down here, and then I split it I split the mult into two, uh, the, the gate signal into going into gate one up here. So that's still there. All right, so then the second one comes out of the uh, gate delay out over here to the gate in of a second envelope that I've set up because I do want them to gate differently and I'll show you why in a second here. So I've taken the second normal envelope to the second VCA, VCA because again, I want it to gate differently. And what I mean by that is, oh, listen for this. Let me plug the clock in, get my favorite sequence running. So over here, actually, let me, let me turn off Big Sky for a moment. All right, so you hear, this is the two, the two voices playing. Left and right. Now if I turn up the gate delay here, It does exactly what it says it's going to do. It's delaying the gate of this second channel. Just enough to make it sound a little bit more wider stereo, a little, a little like a, almost like a delay effect, right? You can turn it way up and get different results, of course. You can also set how long the, the gate is. If, if you have a short, like a long gate up here, you could then make it shorter here again. I'll keep everything kind of short. So now I'll bring Big Sky back in. So I think that sounds pretty cool. And that's what gate delay does. It just, again, adds a little bit of a delay to the gate. <laughs> There's a threshold knob here. There's a delay time that you saw me twisting and then a gate time to change the gate one more time if you need to. So this little module is kind of cool. I'm gonna take this VCO out and I'm gonna bring it over here to the SIG in first. And then I'll just jump it out, SIG out right back to where it was over here, the VCF. 
And so now the, su the signal is going through this, this uh, phase shifter here. So let me turn down the sound. Let me kill big sky, kill the big sky, and turn on the clock again. So now you have, uh, we have no filtering going on. Everything's wide open. But over here, we have this frequency knob. for what frequencies you want to phase shift a little bit. And then there's a resonance knob, which this, just like a lot of these Behringer things, these resonance knobs don't seem to do a whole hell of a lot until you get to the very top. I mean, I was even watching it in data down here and I didn't see it do anything until it got way up here. And then there's an internal LFO here that's normaled up here. You can barely hear it. But if you wanted one of your one of your voices to to change sound a little bit, you could do it that way. Uh, you could also. Let's grab a cable here. Let's grab one of my LFOs here just for just randomly try this out. If you plug an LFO in, now you now you get more action. How intense do you want that? What frequency do you want to shift? And then is there any any uh, resonance on it? So it's just another way to, to manipulate the sound. What I do kind of wish is that, that the resonance or the frequency, I wish the frequency was, uh, you could modulate that because that would sound pretty cool to sweep that. So with that in mind, I guess I can just, uh, let's drop it down to Drop it down to the audio one real quick and take a listen to see what the what audio audio delay sounds like. Let me uh, kill the sound one more time. We're going back to no big sky. Again, not super sure what this is doing. But if I take my LFO, turn my intensity up, so this is delay time. I have no idea what that's doing. Anyone else know? <laughs> I have no idea what that's doing. I mean, I can hear a little bit of, I can hear a sound in there, but I don't, I don't really know what I would use that for. So that's that. And then of course there's a little tiny LFO in here that you can use either internally or uh, for, for other things. You can, you know, it's a real simple LFO. So it doesn't even have shapes. It's probably just a sign. Uh, so that's it for the uh, pitch shifter, audio delay, LFO, and gate delay modules, or module inside this module. That's kind of all that does. This is also a good example of the of the mults, how the mults work. I haven't figured out how to use the gates yet, so I'm not even gonna get into that right now. 
Um, I think for the rest of this, uh, and I definitely don't know how to use this guy, um, but over here, what you, you've seen me playing with panning and the volume of the mixer. So that's pretty straightforward. There's a little tuner in here too. I guess I forgot to show that off earlier. For tuning, I, I use data because I'm just, I'm a robot and that's what I remembered. So I didn't, didn't think that I had this, but this allows, this lets you tune by ear. And I'm kind of a visual guy, so that's why I use data. But you turn this up and you can tune to A440, 220, uh, if you want, if you want to use that. Uh, there's also this uh, quarter inch out, 3.5 millimeter out, headphone out, uh, and then the master master out volume there. Parametric EQ is right here. I'm finding it has it has only one CV in though. So, and then it's, it's also normal to one anyway. So um, not really finding a whole lot of use <laughs> for the parametric EQ if it only does one channel. I thought it was gonna do all for everything coming in. It would EQ the whole thing, but uh, apparently not. So that might not come in too handy. Anyway, um, what else do we got? We're going, we're going to build out another voice. So let's do that real quick. All right, I need to jump uh, CV here out to the quantizer in. Now the quantizer comes out and comes over here, and now I should be able to tune this. Let's see what we got. Let me jump this down here real quick just for tuning purposes. And I know this is a, I know this is a B. So the note, the note is B, B, G, E, B, B, E, G, B. Those are my, those are my four notes. So B. G, E, B. All right, and then I want them to be bass notes. So that is that. Now I want to pull, I want to tune the second VCO. And how I'm going to do that is turn that off. And I think I want this to be fifths of that note. So if that was B3, we want an F sharp. And then tune it up. So F sharp, come on, F sharp, D. B. And then back to F sharp. And then of course we're gonna drop it down again. Because I want fifths is what I'm looking for here. That's what I want. All right. So for now, I'm just going to leave these these initial gains turned up, and let's play. Let's, let's play with it a little bit. So things are a little out of tune. So I kind of want a little bit of an envelope on that. So this means I'm now going to have to do a build another gate circuit. So to build a gate circuit, I'm going to come out of the second sequencer's gate to another another malt here, number two, and then I get to do I get to build uh, another one of these. Just for now, I'm going to put one in here. 
and I will take uh, again two uh, two out of the first one and then bring them down here turn up their attenuators turn down their initial gain so now I want this to be a long decay So I have my basic song figured out of what I want to do. I've got my melody going on here. I've got the bass notes tinkling away behind it. I've got envelopes generating uh, to, to carry out the notes. Everything's going through Big Sky. I'm going to turn up the reverb now. So at this point, if I want to start doing some interesting things, I can start looking for my LFOs. Uh, like I want to, I want to do something with the, like with this bass tone. So let's grab a, let's grab an LFO here. Keep it on low. Turn up the attenuation. So now the LFO, or the LFO is going to open and close the cutoff frequency. You could do the same thing with the uh, with the other bass, the low bass. on an inverted uh, inverted LFO so they're so they're oscillating differently I could also bring up the initial gain on the bass notes a little bit so they never really fully fade out and then since we're messing with LFOs let's uh, let's do one of these uh, one of these pulse width mods here Like if we put these, if we put the melody into this uh, pulse width mode and stick a, a LFO into it, another LFO you can do is into uh, the pitch again. Or maybe the second one that's not modulating. Give it a little vibrato. So, so that's kind of it for uh, <laughs> for what I've got so far. Uh, just a quick demo of, of how to patch things up, how to modulate some points using LFOs. Uh, you, you have three of them in here if you, if you have this set up. I've got one in the ring mod. I've got one in, in two of these, or two of them in these two different envelopes uh, over here. Uh, we also have a little one buried inside of the uh, phase shifter if you need another LFO, you got one here. And of course, all of these things can be stuck into a mult and split even further if you, if you really wanted to do that. So... 
uh, super extensible. I, I really like the uh, a lot of the stuff here with the System 100. Uh, it's doing exactly what I wanted to do. Learning how to integrate the two racks together and build an entire song on the big rack while this one's just doing the loop is going to be a big learning curve for me. So it's probably going to take me a month or so to figure that out. So uh, <sighs> thank you for hanging out on the journey so far, though. Um, <laughs> I'll see you sometime in April.